Hey everyone, a new face here today. My name is Kendall and I'm one of the staff members here at MCC. This week, Pastor Trent has been walking us through Holy Week and we've been leaning into the things that Jesus said, did, and experienced the seven days leading up to Easter Sunday. Those videos have been super impactful for me and I think that they would be for you too. So if you missed one of the days, we made it super easy for you. You can find them on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So if you've missed any of the videos, you can check them out there. Today, we're leaning in to Maundy Thursday. A lot of other scholars refer to it as Holy Thursday, Covenant Thursday, Thursday of Mysteries, but I believe that Maundy Thursday has a very significant meaning that we'll get to in just a little bit. Now on this day, we see Jesus in two main places. The first place that we see him is in the upper room with his disciples. Here, Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover and they were eating the last supper together. In mid-meal, Jesus gets up, takes his, his outer garments off, wraps a towel around his waist, and he starts to wash the disciples' feet. This is a huge moment in the whole day, and I'm not gonna go into great detail about it because this is the exact passage that we studied this past Sunday here at MCC. So if you haven't seen or heard or listened to it, you should definitely go back and watch or listen or rewatch or listen at mccreach.org slash podcast. But after Jesus gets back from washing their feet, he sits down at the table and he issues a new commandment. Now, Mondi, um, a lot of scholars believe the Latin word mandatum, or mandatum, which sounds like mandate in English, uh, means command. And so Jesus issues in John 13, 34 through 35, a new command. And he says, a new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So as they're celebrating this Passover, um, this whole celebration was a celebration of God rescuing his people from Egypt. And you can read all about that in the book of Exodus. But for Jesus to offer a new command, when the old one was so important to Israel's history, it was, it was kind of crazy. So rather than remembering the redemption of their forefathers from the tyranny in Egypt, in the way that the angel had passed over the homes with the lamb bloods, lamb's blood spread on their doorposts, they were now to remember him. They were to remember Jesus and the body that was broken for them and the blood that was shed for them. Jesus picks up the bread and he says, take this and eat it. This is my body. He takes the cup and he picks it up and says, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In Christ's death, death just wasn't avoided. Now death was going to be defeated. This new command to love others like Jesus had loved us, that was a new definition and a higher standard that was only able to accomplish through the sacrifice of Jesus. Now we can experience and know the forgiveness of sins and the full love of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus loved his enemies to the point of death, and we're called to that same level of love to everyone. God loved us while we were still sinners, and that gift of salvation calls us forward to do likewise. The second place we see Jesus is, the, is at the foot of the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. While Judas is off trying to find the religious leaders um, ready to betray Jesus, Jesus is in the garden with his disciples, knelt down in agony and prayer, surrendering to the Father's will. Let's read together Mark 14, 32 through 35 as it paints this picture. They went to the place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him and he began to deeply, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Ah, but Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but you will. Throughout all the whole Gospels and the ministry of Jesus, we hear this phrase, the time has not yet come or my hour has not yet come. But today, I mean, even in verse 41, we see that the hour has come. Through this, we see the humanity of Jesus and the agony that he is facing in this moment. Another scholar put it like this, 
The Bible often records Jesus saying his hour had not yet come, but on Maundy Thursday, he knew that the beginning of the fulfillment of his greatest mission on earth had come. All Jesus' human life had anticipated this hour. Every careful attempt at keeping the messianic secret, every emotional investment poured gladly into his disciples, every glimpse of the ocean of his kindness as he healed the blind, the mute, the lame, the demonized, and even raised the dead. Now the hour has come. All history hinges on this hour, and it's utterly terrifying. Jesus must decide. Will he protect his own skin and soul? Or will he embrace his Father's painful and perfect will? So my question to you today is, what area of your life do you need to say those same words? Father, not my will, but yours be done. Do you need to say it in regards to your finances, your career or your future, about a relationship, or decisions that you have to make that are gonna affect your whole family and your kids? What is it today that you need to say, Father, not my will, but yours?